Father God, I thank you and I praise you and I honor you for your wisdom, your understanding, and especially your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, for every person who will watch this video. I thank you that you release unto them increased understanding of your ways, increased wisdom in how to walk as in our authority as a son of God, that we can truly understand this and we can move into areas of earned authority, not just I have authority because. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for the Holy Spirit watching over and keeping each of us and keeping our families as we participate in all that we hold dear. I thank you, Father. I thank you that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and we love not our life unto death. I praise you and I bless you, Lord. And I thank you that you have anointed me as a teacher. So I step into Jesus, the eternal rabbi, the eternal teacher. And I thank you for teaching through me. I thank you. I thank you so much. I do not take it lightly, the gift that you have given me. Praise you and bless you forever and ever. In the mighty name of Jesus. Okay. So we're going to begin on this teaching. And I changed the title to Understanding Authority. And as I am really very serious about not being responsible for being needless, for needless casualties of war. And I'm going to tell you a couple stories before I start, where you can see where people stepped in to a position where they should have been hiding. They took on what they had no authority to take on. One was a good friend of mine from California, and she was living in Arizona, and she was also Native Indian. And she took on the principality over the Apache Nation by herself in her car. Now, I know this woman operated as a prophet, but when we're in the midst of the enemy's territory, we really need to be hidden in Christ, and we only move into that kind of effort when the Lord says do. Not because we can, but because we have to wait in obedience for the Lord's instruction in all of this. Now what happened is she ended up having a horrific car accident on that reservation. She was brain damaged for the rest of her life. And she died because of complications from that accident, which caused her to develop de dementia and to lose, lose who she was. Now, another situation happened. I was out in Las Vegas at a Sandy Brown evangelism school. And these two or three women were driving from Chicago to Las Vegas. And they got on the probably Navajo reservation. And they decided to take on the principality over the Navajos. Well, their car broke down in the desert. They did not have enough water. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, it could have had a terrible outcome because some of those desert roads as you cut across the country are very remote. Now, when you're in a situation that you know you're going into um, literally a region controlled by hell, there's a lot of work that has to be handled in intercession, in the courts, before you even consider, even consider, we have to know who we're warring against. We have to know who's standing against us. But I, when I'm traveling, when we were in Haiti, we wanted a shield of invisibility. We asked the Lord to have the people, the witch doctors, the people who would curse, that we would be perceived as stupid missionaries, which there were many that were operating in foolishness. So sometimes wisdom requires us to be hidden. So I want to be very, very clear about that before I even begin, because I do not want to be responsible for you taking on principalities, powers, rulers over nations, over regions, even over cities. This is a place of earned authority, and you earn your authority through faithfulness in intercession, managing those areas that he's given you responsibility over effectively. 
So um, with that caveat released, let's talk about spiritual authority. So the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the definition of authority in scripture. So it literally means authorized to act to the extent you've been guided by faith in his revealed word. Now note, you can act to the extent that you've been guided by faith in his revealed world. If this revealed word is not rhema to you and is only logos, then logos is when it's in the brain and we understand it with our mind in its intellectual consent. But to become logo, to become rhema, it has to drop from our brain down into our spirit man where it becomes alive. And when it's alive, we can have faith in that word. And we get the word, the word to become living word when we spend time meditating on the scriptures that the Lord has given us to meditate on. So it's not just because you read something in scripture, you have authority to act on it. You can act to the extent, to the extent you're guided by faith in his living rhema word. It also means to be conferred with power, and it's the power to act. Now, Ralph Mahoney says spiritual authority may be defined as the power to stand in his name and the authority of Jesus Christ and to enforce his will over spiritual and physical powers and circumstances. We have to begin with our own life. So when we stand in the name of Jesus, when something is personally coming against us, I can remember in the early days of my walk, I would be assaulted in my bed, and literally there would be a presence that would come and press down on me. And I knew, and all I had to get out of my, my mouth was Jesus. And that was all I could do. But as soon as I said the name of Jesus, that thing left. So I had to get an understanding that I had authority over that, whatever those demons were that were harassing me. And it was his name. It was his name. And then we also have to have a living understanding of the power of the blood of Jesus. So we have to begin to take authority over those spiritual and physical circumstances in our own life and gain the victory. So Webster defines authority as the power or right to command or act from dominion, or a person exercising power of command, or a source or expert in the field to support an action, opinion, or fact. Vine's Greek word for authority is exousia. It means the ability or strength with which one is endued, and then the right to exercise the power. So it's talking about a power that's coming from God. The power to command is coming from God. And so we have to look at what did Jesus tell us to do to receive this power? Because if you're not operating in the pattern that Jesus Christ gave his disciples, then you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt. So what was his charge to his disciples? Now, the, this morning, the Lord just quickened me and said, look at my last words in the Gospels and, and in Acts 1. So I did. In Luke 24, 47 through 49, it, it describes the verse above it about his cross and the reason for his cross. And that repentance for forgiveness of sin could be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you're to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So there was a promise here. He's, send, he's going to send forth the promise of the father. <coughs> And we have to be clothed with power. Now, it's not something we receive just because we receive salvation. We have to be clothed with power. So when was the clothing with power? In Acts 1.8, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you literally are clothed with the Spirit of God, with the power of God. And because of this, you shall be my witnesses. Again, notice the witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Our witness begins in our own city. Our witness begins in our own family, in our own church. That we are 
operating from this power. And then the 120 of the disciples, they tarried in that upper room. And the Holy Spirit came upon them with tongues of fire. And they began to speak in unknown tongues. Now the problem in many churches is that the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is not being released to the people. The people do not understand it. They're afraid of it because there's been no teaching. So the very first thing you need is to be clothed with power from above. And if you're in a situation where the churches in your region are not spirit-filled and they aren't releasing the baptism of the Holy Spirit to you, I want you to know that you personally can go and tarry with God and you can cry out and pray and fast for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he has promised, this is a promise of the Father, that he was going to give it to his people. And only out of that power can be, be witnesses to the far-reaching portions of the earth. When missionaries go out without being clothed in the power of God, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they are subject to such an assault of darkness because they're not standing in their authority. They're not standing in the power that's been released upon them. So let's look at some of the words from Acts 1, 8. You have to receive, literally in the Greek means, aggressively, actively accepting what is offered, specifically regarding the will, the volition of the receiver. That's where we have to actively, aggressively seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is something that is not understood, but if you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you know that you know that you received that laying out of hands or through a supernatural gifting that God just came down upon you, then you need to aggressively and actively be seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You, if it means going to another city and looking and finding a church that's endued with power, you need to do that because this is something that is by the volition of your own will. It's the volition. It's a free will church. It's free will of the believer. And if by your free will you are rejecting this gift, you're rejecting the promise of the Father and how he endued his church with power and with authority. The power there is the power, might, and strength through God's ability. See, we can't do this in and of ourselves. We don't have authority over anything. Me and my natural man, I mean, I'd be beat up like the sons of Sceva. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? And they know who we are when we are endued with that power, when we are covered in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. Witnesses. This is very interesting. It's a legal term, and it means God's witness of what you yourself have seen, heard, and know. No. This is our witness of the power that has come upon our lives. The witness is we've seen God move as we have stood in his authority. And it's promised, he promised the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16 through 17, and John 15, 26. I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. But we have to actively receive the Holy Spirit. When we receive salvation and accept Jesus Christ, you confess your sins and acknowledge that he's the son of God and he died for you, then the spirit of God comes to live in our spirit. Our spirit comes alive unto God. But that is different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we have to aggressively pursue. Now, in my background, I was raised a good Catholic. I knew the Holy Spirit. I knew the Father. I knew Jesus. I could hear him, but it took the baptism of the Holy Spirit for my life to shift. And then it took me walking in utter obedience to his word for me to really be endued with power and authority. So this is, 
It's not that all believers are walking in this. If it were, we'd be walking in the miraculous. So ask yourself, have I aggressively pursued what God has freely given to the church, the promise? And I was afraid of tongues. I understand that. But I, when I was laid hands on for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I literally said, I want your baptism. I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit but I don't want tongues. But if I need them, I receive them. And I woke up in the middle of the night, two nights later, praying in fluent tongues. My spirit inside of me was praying. I just opened my mouth and it released it. And I'm going to tell you, praying in tongues proved to be an incredible gift, especially in the beginning when I didn't know how to pray or what to pray. So let's look at some more of Jesus' last words to his church. Matthew 28, 18, 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we know that Jesus has all authority. And we know that we are in his body. We are part of his body. And he is head over us. And the authority that is on him is in us. As we go back to that, the extent that we're guided by faith in his living word. But notice he's telling us to be baptizing them and to be disciples of nations. This is, this is there's a great commission to go and get people saved, but there's an even a greater commission, which is to disciple the nations. Mark 17, 15, and 20 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creations. So this is the preaching of the word, the preaching of salvation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, and he who has not believed shall be condemned. But this is where it gets so interesting. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So when, Jesus, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. Now we're supposed to have signs that follow as we walk in this earth. But notice these are, you can't do any of these things without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without the power. Because we're not even supposed to go to the nations. Remember, first Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. In Revelation 12, 10 and 11, now salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, I love Revelations, has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been cast down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even when faced with death. Now, we're called to be overcomers. And the first way that we overcome is by the blood. But what does it mean to overcome? It means to conquer, prevail, be victorious, subdue, overpower. So if we're going to overcome, we're going to overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ. That means the power of the cross, the power of the finished work of the cross putting the enemy in remembrance of what happened and how he publicly dis disarmed them and humiliated them in hell. We have to work meditating the word to get these scriptures so alive and so real in us. So the blood there is the blood, and it, it's blood shed. So it's blood that's been shed by violence. It also means sacrificial victims. The lamb, I love the lamb. It's virgin-like purity and innocence, and it called it a lambkin, which kin at the end of a word would be like a baby lamb. 
the smallest, most innocent, the purest. So because of the blood of this, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and is all of his innocence and purity, who became sin to free us from the power of sin. Then the word there, because of the word of their testimony, this is the logos. This is when we share our testimony. Our testimony is our witness with those around us. Our life is a living epistle. And as we live in obedience to Jesus Christ, we are a witness to both the angels and to the powers of darkness. And they love not their life even when faced with death. The love there is agapeo, which I love that it's agapeo. And that's preferring to live for Christ, embracing God's will, obeying through his power. It's loving through his love. So we're, we're able to do this. We're able to choose death over death to our life. The life there is suke, which is soul, self-life, all the seed of affections and of our will. If we're going to overcome, we have to be operating out of knowing that the love of God is enough, that he's enough. We can live with Christ in us, the hope of glory. We can embrace God's will by obeying obedience through his power. Then we're, when we do that, then we're able to overcome our self-life. Even when we're faced with death, physical death. So it's important that we understand what we're trying to operate in and how God, Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit prepared all this from the foundations of the earth. From the foundations of the earth, Jesus Christ was crucified. Before the foundations of the earth, the sacrifice was made. Before the foundations of the earth, we were already in him. It was all prepared beforehand for us to walk in. But if we're going to walk in it, we have to walk in it his way, understanding the power of knowing his word and that becoming living in us so we can have faith in his word so that we can overcome by knowing the power of the cross. We overcome by knowing the power of the blood. We overcome by the word of our testimony, what's coming out of our mouths what we're speaking over circumstances and situations. This is how we live. Now, the scripture we were supposed to start with today, all this is what I wrote this morning. The scripture I was supposed to start was Luke 10, 19. And this was a scripture that when I really began intercession, began to roll in my spirit. So when you get a spirit, a, a scripture that begins to roll in you, the Lord keeps on bringing to your remembrance. This means you must meditate in, on it and you must let it become a living word on the inside of you that you have faith in. So um, I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now people take this and if you take it out of context, you can get yourself in trouble. So in the context of verse one, he's sending out 70 of his disciples two by two. And the purpose is to prepare the way for Jesus to come to those cities. That was their charge. Verse 17, they return rejoicing because even the demons were subject to us in your name. It was the name of Jesus. Now, looking at their authority, we have to see first that they were appointed. He appointed them for the work. They were under his authority, and he gave them very specific commands on how they were to walk and what they were to do in the cities. This is where he said, if you come into a house and they welcome you, bless the house. If they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and move on. The word is very clear that he's given us power and authority over all the power of the enemy. But we have a caveat here. One, we must be submitted to the instructions of the Lord. We have to be sent with his authority to do what he's sending us to do. And we can't step outside of our realm of authority. We use his name 
understanding that the power is in him, the power in his, in him, because all power and authority is vested in him. So we, in all of this, we have to walk in humility. Now, authority does not mean we dominate or rule over people. We serve them. We've been called to be a servant. In prayer, we cannot project our mind and our will over another person. When I go to pray for someone who's dying, I don't just immediately assume that God wants to heal them. I ask the question, Lord, what is your will? And what is the will of the person? And there'll be times when the Lord says they want to die. And then I, I release them to die. I release the grace of God that they can finish whatever they need to finish before they are taken home. We can't just automatically assume in everything we do that we know the will of God for the circumstance. We have to seek him. When we seek him and we receive a word from him, then we're able to apply the promises of scripture for that person. Because we don't want to walk in witchcraft. It's ungodly to exercise your will over another in the guise of intercession or spiritual authority. We have to walk so circumspectly here. We have to recognize that we cannot presume. We have to go to the Father. We have to get the wisdom of God, the counsel of God, and how to pray. Now, our own submission to authority is our protection. And it's not for the purpose of restriction. So I'm submitted to my husband. And my husband walks in great wisdom. And he warns me when I'm stepping out of, into something I shouldn't step into. And I heed him. And those times when I didn't, I stepped out of protection. So I'm warning you. So we're submitted in our church. And it's, it's really important. When I go to the church prayer meeting, I'm not assuming because I have authority in intercession that I have authority in intercession in that house, in that meeting. I submit to the way the meeting is going. I don't stand there in pride. I just say, okay, Lord, how do you want me to pray? It doesn't matter how skilled I am. What matters, am, am I submitting to the house? Am I following the directions of the house? Because when I follow the directions of the house, there is safety. Now, when a child of God does not use his spiritual authority, he's going to be a defeated, defeated Christian. God has made this power and authority available. If we don't use it, we're defeated. Now, for a new believer, there's some basic basics you can do that are so important. One is the name of Jesus. Now, my sister, she was really, and as a late teenager, she was really on a road to destruction. And God, in his rich mercy, got her saved in a, oh, I think it was an assembly of God's church. When she received salvation, she wept bitterly. She went home immediately. She had moved out, was living with this man who later became her husband, and with great rebellion. And she went home that night and repented to my parents and stayed there. She did not go back to where she was living. So a couple days later, she went back to her, the apartment she was living in, and her current husband, her lover all of her life, he was furious with her that he was, she was leaving him. And he was raging. And she took the name of Jesus and she commanded him to sit down and listen. And she preached the gospel to him. And he received salvation. Now, that was a brand, brand, brand new believer but the name of Jesus is that powerful. And they've gone on and they have a wonderful ministry and pastor a church. And it began with her understanding the power of the name of Jesus. The same is with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is powerful. 
And when you're in danger, just plead the blood of Jesus over you and your children. I cannot tell you how powerful the blood of Jesus is. But for to have real meaning to you, you've got to meditate the cross. This isn't just like a, a talisman that we just use. It, there has to be faith in it. So let's move on. Let's look at some examples of authority in scripture. I think the most amazing one is the story of Esther and Mordecai. Now, Esther, we know she was chosen to be queen and her husband was a wicked man, according to history. And yet God chose her for such a time as that. And there was Haman was planning the destruction of the Jewish people. And Esther went on a three-day fast, and all the people of Israel passed, that were these Israelites that were in Bab, in this kingdom, they fasted. And then God gave her a strategy, and she followed through on the strategy with her husband. She went to him, even though she had not been called, which took tremendous courage. And he extended the scepter of his favor. Now, on the basis of that, she invited him to dinner. And she also invited Haman. And in the course of these conversations, she was able to bring to the king's attention the letter that had been sent out by Haman to destroy on a certain day, which is Purim, which would have been this past Tuesday, to destroy all the Jews in Persia, I believe. And then the king was reading through the records of the the royal records of the history, and he found about Mordecai and what Mordecai had done for him. So Mordecai then receives the king's signet ring. Now, if you have the king, king's signet ring, it means you can write letters, you can write decrees that are going to be enforced in the land. So he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, I can't say it, Ahasuerus, and sealed it with the king's signet ring and sent the letter. In them, the king granted the Jews who were in each and every city in his kingdom the right to assemble and defend their lives, to destroy and kill any people or province which might attack them, including children and women, and to plunder their spoils. This was totally thwarting the diabolical scheme of Haman to destroy the Israelites and the destiny God had for them. Then in Esther 9.29, Queen Esther, daughter of Ahihel, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. So in this case, because of their courage and their obedience and fasting and praying, they were able to turn and preserve a whole nation of people. And once they did, they had the authority to turn it. Now, in the story of Moses, we know that he was given a rod, and it was a symbol of his authority. And with that rod, we have the story with the magicians, and they throw down their rods. He threw down his rod. It was a snake. The magicians throw down their rods. They have, you know, they've got the power to do that in the occult. And, but his serpent devoured their serpents, which is really what happens when we're walking in the authority of Jesus Christ. So because of that rod, rod, the 10 plagues were released on Egypt. And then we have again the image of the rod at the parting of the Red Sea. Their enemies are ready to overtake them and destroy them. And he raises up his, his rod. God parts the Red Sea. The people pass over and the Egyptians follow them and the sea overtakes them and destroys them all. Then with the rod, the first time, he hit the rock and he brought forth water in the desert. And when then in battle, his arms were upheld with the rod to defeat the enemy. That was his symbol of authority. Moses would be a person that would be probably five-fold apostolic or prophet, an ascension gift to the body of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we look at who we are under, who we're submitted to, and I really encourage you to make certain that you're in the right community of faith, that you're in the right body. 
what we have to understand is the pastor's authority over the church. We're not called as intercessors to take the rod from the pastor's hand. We're not called to interfere with his office. We're called, if we're called to a specific church and we've given and been given an assignment in a specific church, we're called to help, support, not overrule the vision and plans that the Lord has given to the pastor. Now, when I was in intercession, in leading intercession, I would get words for the pastor and I would take them to the pastor. I submitted them to the pastor, but once I gave it to him, it was no longer my responsibility to bring that word forth. And the pastor could either heed what I said or he could ignore it. But I had to release it and I could not, absolutely could not touch it with words, with opinions, with judgments. So we cannot say we're submitted to God and not be to submitted to our leaders in spiritual matters. That's why it's so important to be in a church that you truly can be submitted to the leadership. The word of God is always our authority. And we're told to submit and to pray for our leaders. So there's six and basic conditions for spiritual authority. The first one is relationship. And it's relationship with the Lord. It's developed through our intimate times with him. This is not developed in intercession. My personal relationship with Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit is developed through my times of worship, my times of intimacy, my times of waiting on him, and truly expecting him to be so real to me. And because of this relationship, I know John 5.30. I can do nothing in my own initiative. So it's not our own initiative we start anything. As I hear, as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will. Remember, we love not our life unto death. That's our self-will. But the will of him who sent me. So Jesus said he didn't do anything unless he saw the Father doing it. Now you have to, there's a knower inside of many of us. Not all of us see, not all of us hear, but we will have some means of communicating with the Father. My primary way of communicating is I just know. I get flooded with the knowing. I get flooded with the love of God. <clears throat> I get flooded. And when I get flooded, I weep in adoration. I weep with joy. But I have a relationship. In this relationship, it is as grown as it's strengthened as it's become so real in my life. Because I've been walking with flinty faced determination, saved at seven, but flinty faced determination since 1982. 81. Baptized in the Holy Spirit in 77. Went into rebellion at my, at my divorce came out of rebellion in 81, real, and then started my journey. And it's, a, it's the journey with the Holy Spirit. So we also have to know our God. I love Isaiah 40, so I'm going to go there now. It's, I spent, I've spent so much time meditating this. Again, it's what's real in us. You know, if... If the enemy is bigger than God, then you've got a problem. Because you're going to give him. Fear is how he operates. So, in this script, it's starting in 22 is where I'm going to start. Let's see. 12 through 15 it says. Oh. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Think about it. In the hollow of his hand, he's measured the waters. All the waters of the earth has been measured in, the, in this hand. Who's marked off the heavens with the span of his hand? Just the span of his hand, he's marked off the heavens. Think about the incredible depth of the universe. He's marked it off. 
That's how big our God is. That's how big our God is. Imagine the greatness and the bigness of God. Who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure? All the dust of the earth in a measure. And weighed the mountains on scales and hills in, the ba in a balance. 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are counted as small dust upon the scales. He takes up the aisles like a very little thing. We have to look at how big is our God? Do we really understand him as almighty God, the creator of the universe, who is eternal, who everything was created when he spoke and everything was created? How big is your God or is the enemy bigger? Have you chosen to give the enemy such power and authority over your life? Now, if you don't know how big your God is, you need to spend time reading these scriptures from Isaiah 40 out of lots of translations and use your imagination and see it. See how big your God is. When you see how big your God is, then you see how small your problems are. You see how small the problems of the nations are. You know that everything can be overcome because of him, because of his promises, because of his word. And then tw verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created all these. He who brings out their host by number and calls them all by name. The host there is the stars of heaven. He calls them all by name through the greatness of his might. And because he's strong in power, not one is missing or lacks anything. And it goes on. Why, O oh Jacob, do you say and declare, O oh Israel, my way and my lot are hidden from the Lord, and my right is passed over without regard from God? We do that. We got, God doesn't see what I'm suffering. God doesn't understand. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint or grow weary. There's no searching of his understanding. And he gives the power to the faint and weary. And to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it to abound. Even youths shall faint and grow weary, and young men shall feebly stumble and be all exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, who look for, who hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power they shall lift up wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. These are our promises, but we have to know how big our, is our God. We have to know that our name is inscribed in the palm of his hand. We have to know that we're, his, we're ever before him. We're ever before him. And we have to, our God has to be big. If it, our God isn't big, we're in trouble. <laughs> We're in trouble. We cannot limit him to the fallen sons of God who are in rebellion over the earth and think this is who really rules the earth. We have to walk in righteousness. It's his righteousness, but we only are righteous through the cross of Jesus Christ. We have to have faith. Remember, all authority is coming from our faith in the revealed living word. That's the extent we're going to have it. So if you need faith, then you meditate the word of God. Obedience. He says, obedience is better than sacrifice. And I love when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. There's no two ways about this. We have to keep his commands. It's not like we can be involved in sin. You know, churches that are involved in adultery, churches that are involved in Freemasonry, churches that have rejected the Holy Spirit. Do not expect those churches to walk in authority and walk in healing or deliverance. 
and then the anointing. The anointing begins with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then we move into the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed or consecrated, set me apart for his service, to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. It's all those who mourn in Zion. Now, there's principles of authority. First, we have to realize who we are. And Matthew 5.13 says, you are a light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. We cannot hide our light to fit in with society. We can't hide who we are to be approved of man, to be affirmed of man. And Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, arise, shine, for your light has come. The light is Jesus Christ in us. And the glory of God has risen upon you. And realize who's backing us up. We've been given the full armor of God. It's our spiritual armor. A helmet of salvation. That's to protect our thinking. And all of the ways of the world that we try to establish strongholds in us. That are in opposition to the word of God. A blessed breastplate of righteousness to protect our heart. We have to know that we're righteous because of the cross of Jesus Christ. The belt of truth is the word of God. We have to have truth. The truth of God, only the truth of God. You can't be double-minded in truth because an unstable man, one who doubts and wavers, receives nothing from the Lord. So it's the truth of God's word. We have the sword of the spirit which I've already talked to you about, which is the word of God and the shield of faith. It's the shield of faith. It's God's shield. He's given us this faith. And when we choose to believe, we begin to walk in that faith and that faith and that shield will become stronger and stronger as your faith in him, your faith in his word grows and grows and grows in your heart. Now, this is our uniform. Now, this uniform we walk in the world with is explaining to everyone what our authority comes from. It's like a, a police officer wears a uniform. He has no authority without that uniform because that uniform basically tells who we belong to and who is backing up what we say. So that is incredibly important that our armor of God is true, that it's the true armor of God that we have put on. Now, Matthew 18, 18, Jesus said, truly I say to you, whatever you shall bind. Now, this is when he was given the keys of the kingdom. That's declared to be unlawful, prohibited, forbid on earth. Must already have been declared unlawful, prohibited and forbidden in heaven. See, that's why we have to know the word of God. We have to know what is forbidden, and that's his commandments, if we're gonna be able to use our keys effectively. And whatever you loose, that's release, permit, on earth is already loosed, permitted, in heaven. So we've gotta understand this. We are not operating out of our own authority. We're operating out of the kingdom of God. What the kingdom of God forbids, what the kingdom of God permits. And when we step into our role and we begin to forbid, say this is not lawful because of the blood of Jesus, this is sin. That it is not lawful for the demons to be harassing you. So in the name of Jesus, I forbid your harassment. In the name of Jesus, the blood stands against you. I am in the blood of Jesus. I am in him. My life is hid in Christ, in God. And the enemy can't touch me because of this. So when we step into action... The Father's going to go into action because we're doing his will. 
according to his word, according to his promises. Jesus Christ goes into action in all the authority that he's given and given. The Holy Spirit goes into action within us, and we arise in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let's see here. Well, that's all. I thank you all for being a part today. And I hope, I hope I brought this forward in a way that people understand what's required in order to truly walk in authority. I'm going to end meeting for all. And we will meet. I'll type in our address.